Thank you for that generous introduction, and thank you as well to the SAR for inviting me to be here tonight. It is quite the honor. Um, I'll begin with uh, introductions. Um, I was going to begin with you, not about you, but you, you, you ducked out of the, the screen there. That's quite all right. I'll move on instead to um, the gentleman seated to my right, at center stage. Uh, we have here Jarrett So, uh, who is a fourth generation Diné potter. In addition to showing his work regularly at the Santa Fe Indian Market, each August, Jared is earning a Master of Fine Arts degree in ceramics at the University of New Mexico. Equally interesting is the fact that Jared has an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering, also from UNM, which he puts to good use in his other life as an electrical engineer <laughs> for Mesa Photonics LLC here in Santa Fe. Seated uh, to Jarrett's right is Nana, Nana Mabek, who is a second generation Dene uh, jeweler. She's also the founder of Not Above Nana Mabek Designs. In addition, she's the 2018 recipient of the First People Fund Artists in Business Leadership Fellowship, as well as the School of American Research's Ronald and Susan Dillon Native Artists Fellowship in Artists in Residency. Also, she's worked with the Hurt Museum, the National Museum of the American Indian, and the Arizona Humanities Council, which I believe is where you were at when we met some 10 or so years ago, yes. So in order to get this uh, discussion underway, I did jot down a few notes. With respect to the theme of our discussion tonight, namely the relation between innovation and tradition, I want to begin by asking each of you to go back to the beginning. More specifically, I want to ask you to tell us the story of how you became the artist you are today. How did you learn your craft? What themes, images, or issues inform your work? And what role, if any, does tradition, quote unquote, play in what you create and how you define yourself as an artist? And with that, Nanaba, I'd like to ask you to go first, please. Right. Thank you. And um, I was the Ronald and Susan Dubin um, Artist Fellowship in last year, in 2018. Um, and so the history of my story, um, I actually am, like he said, a second generation jeweler. My father, Victor Beck, uh, taught my mother and I, and was really, um, uh, key in allowing me to understand fabrication, making things from, um, you know, just the plate and the raw stones. And then um, it was just something for me to help him in my early years from 13 to maybe 30. Um, in between all of that, the information that I gathered in school as an undergrad at Arizona State University, um, my majors were anthropology, my minors were American Indian Studies and Art History. Um, all of that really informed my work and also my, my life as growing up within the art market and being surrounded by people who I look up to today, um, namely the Kassam family, a couple of people who are here, and also being surrounded by people who are academics. Um, I met David at a point where I wasn't an artist, I was going into museum studies, so the American Indian Studies um, collections around the United States at NMAI, University of Pennsylvania, the Heard Museum, and then the Peabody Essex Museum. As well, I was here with the Swire crew back in 2010, getting an idea of how everything works to create this market. Um, and the conversations I had in school really brought out uh, a lot of what I saw but just didn't know how, what to call it when I was growing up behind the booth. Colonization, relocation, assimilation, capitalism, um, all those shun words that describe so much of our history. Um, and it's something that also didn't connect with how I was living it. So uh, we 
continued to have these conversations of identity in college, talking about, um, you know, how are we able to maintain the, the richness, but also not falling within the lines of, um, of what marketing does so well, of calling it these words like contemporary and traditional. Um, earlier, we were discussing uh, the peoplehood paradigm that uh, Bob Thomas, um, a social scientist, had, dis um, had uh, spoken about and actually informs Vine Deloria as a mentor or advisor to Vine Deloria. So that was something I didn't know the actual name of what it is that I heard about today, but it was something that allowed me to understand that tradition is something that is continuous. It's something that is um, uh, innovative in the way that it is deep and rooted in how we live our lives, not in a two world, but in the way that I just go from Santa Fe to you know, Albuquerque to Flagstaff to Phoenix and back to Pinyon. It's continuous. There is no designation for me. So I find that tradition allows me to describe it in the way that I live my life. It's continuous, it's um, very present. And thankfully with all the people that I've grown up with, um, my family, my cat, my artist families, um, they really um, provided me with that first-hand knowledge and um, just maintaining that is something that I try to do in the work that you see back here behind me. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I think when I think back to how I started down this road, I didn't realize it until I was older, where I, I went to visit my aunt in Tuba City and we were talking clay and wanted to do a clay, clay trade because I had been getting clay closer to Albuquerque and at my mom's house in Washington State. And uh, she goes and lifts up a bucket and this smell hit me. Mm -hmm. um, and it was... A specific it took me back to a memory that I totally forgot when I was really young and like the smell of this specific clay of where my grandmother would get her clay um, and I think that was a really pivotal moment because I remember growing up I was surrounded by uh, works from my my parents or my, my dad and uncles and aunts and as my grandparents um, and some of you might know um, my uh, my grandparents were Faye and Emmett So, um, who were very renowned potters and um, taught a lot of, uh, and influenced a lot of the potters today. Um, and so, on my mom's side, my grandpa was an engineer. And so it's kind of funny that my grandparents heavily influenced me because I remember him always growing up and he'd go fishing and say, you need to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. With an engineer, you can, you can do anything. Uh, you can be a CEO, you can, do whatever you want, a business person. You can be president. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, so I pursued that in uh, my undergrad. And uh, while I pursued that in my undergrad and kind of started in high school is, um, I used pottery and clay as a way to procrastinate uh, <laughs> for my sanity. Um, and really, because um, I always had the desire of seeing my, my grandparents work and my family's work. Um, so I would uh, try to replicate that and had a lot of questions as how do they make it so smooth, how is it so shiny, how do they get this color. Um, and so uh, it just came, became an obsession where I would stay up way past my bedtime trying to make a pot in my tiny apartment um, and hoarding clay in my closet trying to find space for everything. Um, and so I eventually started showing work. and. Um, got accepted to Indian market and showed here and there and was really, um, had a really good response from community, um, not only the Santa Fe community um, of collectors and gallery owners and uh, uh, other people in that realm, but also community from home. Um, and a lot of support and push forward and bringing something to the table manifested, showing my work, my dedication, um, opened up a lot of doors. Um, to get questions an answered by traditional potters. Because uh, sometimes people are, are hesitant to, when you ask them, hey, can you teach me this? Uh, they kind of look at you like, do you know what you're about to get into? 
Uh, do you know how much work it takes? Do you know much how, how much heartbreak it can be when you fly, work hours on a pot and then you break it in a firing, which, perfect timing. Um, I put close to 45 hours into this pot and it broke in the firing. Um, and so I kind of, that's kind of the duality I live in my life. I am a daytime electrical engineer and nighttime I'm a fake candidate. <laughs> I want to talk um, a little bit more about um, the the learning process itself that you each went through. More specifically, you both identify yourselves as uh, as part of multi generational uh, creative families. You know, the first thing I noted about e each of you is that you're the 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 nth generation in your family who is uh, doing jewelry or, or doing pottery. As you were learning how to become artists, whether jewelers, potters, were you given a sense that you were learning a tradition? Was there this um, responsibility that was bestowed, bestowed on you that, that you were carrying on the, the, the culture in a way that um, uh, was important to the community? or? Was uh, your, your education um, much more, I don't know, free-spirited or, or liberating or, or even re rebellious? You want to answer? Uh, I, I'll start. Um, it's, it's for both of you. Yeah, um, I think my view of that while I was doing it was in, innocent. Um, I, I just did it because it was there. Um, I saw these pots and wanted to try it out and I knew it was my family and um, thought it would be really, really powerful to learn. Um, and the only time when people mentioned or the conversation came up about preservation and continuing it on was when other people turned it, pointed it out. Yeah. Um, which made me realize just kind of navigating being an artist. Um, so much of being an artist is putting, it's a performance, there's so much ego involved. Mm -hmm. Um, and it made me realize I have to do this for a community purpose, just like how it's always done um, in terms of teaching. And that's so when it comes to, I guess, preservation now, my viewpoint, it's not necessarily me preserving it, but do, pursuing this MFA to teach yeah. and uh, kind of view pottery is how, how it's always been viewed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And mine was, um, I want to say, you know, we all kind of reach the point in which we understand that the work that we're creating is something more than just the piece that we're making. For me, I shied away from the whole process of selling my pieces because I saw my dad doing it so often and um, I felt that uh, me working and helping him was important because I could see what my assistance for him would provide both financially and you know, physically and spiritually for him. And I would tag along to all of the places that we'd go to buy the turquoise, buy silver, you know, connect with different clients around the way. Um, but when I had, I mean, the reason I became, I guess you could say, an artist, it wasn't to become an artist, it was to sell necklaces with indigenous languages on them because of a uh, thank you card idea that then I was able to turn into um, an actual necklace that uh, provided a conversation starter for people to understand all the different languages in you know our area um, that have the same meanings as family, love, respect, and that was where Instagram took over. And then with Instagram, that's where I built off the premise of purpose and intent. So. That's what I, I didn't want to be connected to my father. I didn't want to be connected to, I know already that I, you know, I say he's my person I learned from, but I learned from a lot of different people um, who influenced how I choose to talk about the work and how I choose to go about um, presenting it. So uh, creating the process, the process is what I found more therapeutic growing up. The monotonous, the late studio nights and you know, knowing exactly what's going to happen um, at the end of the five hours that you're sitting at the wheels creating something. Um, and I feel that it's, it was a gradual m maturity 
from the innocence of being 13, but then uh, becoming more aware of how it does affect people, how it does uh, weigh on the minds, how people choose to be on both ends. So, but the constant conversation and the story, the narrative that was insistent upon the person to share. And um, for me, it's, I'm still navigating that and how I want this to be, you know, uh, available, but also insisting that it also be um, uh, resilient for the way that my friends and my family and future generations can understand that um, the continuity innovation that we have in this jewelry is, um, it's always going to go. It's gonna always going to continue to grow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there is, it's, it's interesting because um, there is so much innocence, and I think I'm always trying to get back to that innocence because sometimes it becomes a bit too much in a way that you spend 40 hours on something and it breaks, <laughs> or, or um, it's um, a lot of soldering and then the torch is too hot and it burns up the, the thin gauge PC, which was not 24, but 18 gauge. So that, that does happen, but it's really therapeutic. Whenever, I'm, whenever I am down and I get myself in that pr making process, um, that's where I find myself to be more whole. Speaking of the, the innocence that you evoked in your answer, I, I want to talk a, a little bit uh, now about the, um, the trope of, of living in, in two worlds that inevitably had to become a part of this discussion in light of our, our themes. Let me preface my, my question by pointing out that for the better part of the past century, um, s scholars uh, like myself have been talking about Indians living between two worlds. It's like um, ever since uh, Charles Eastman, a Dakota writer and activist, you know, wrote his autobiography at, at the turn of the last century. You know, he told the story about how uh, when he was sent to the white man's school by his father, his father um, told him that um, I'm, I'm sending you to school as if I'm sending you on the warrior's path meaning that uh, I may never see you again. And so there's this uh, sense of, of, of heroism you know, involved in, uh, in um, uh, traversing that uh, journey between our indigenous world into the white man's world. And certainly ever since um, Darcy McNichol wrote The Surrounded, we've been dealing with this mentality that Indian people, by definition, live between two worlds. So with that um, intellectual tradition in mind, I want to ask the two of you, is the two world um, um, paradigm, speaking of paradigms, an appropriate way of describing um, your relationship you know, between um, the art that you create and the world in which um, it's enjoyed and consumed and, and so forth? Um, more specifically, does your work enable you to bridge the two worlds? Or does it um, evoke a kind of uh, existential crisis? Um, I've come to terms with that concept many years ago. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm a student of um, the American Indian Studies program at ASU, and so much of that conversation kept on being brought up. And I, understood it and I appreciated it. However, it did create a schism for me to see that, you know, where's the line in the road? Of course, you can think of boundaries like the res reserv reservation boundaries or the spaces that we hold to be those boundaries. However, when I step out, I'm still wearing the same clothes, I still have the same jewelry, and I still have a sense of mind, of person, and placehood that allows me to not have to be physically bound to a place. So. The two worlds make it seem like these physical, like this, this schism that you have to keep on going back and forth. And my mind's already going back and forth in so many directions. If I have to build it into the two world mentality, then I don't think that um, it's going to be helpful for me overall. So for a long time, it is one thing that does bother me when people do bring up the idea that there is this two world. But I think it's important to understand how knowledge and academia um, is also fluid in the way that they understand what 
they are learning and teaching and then also um, reiterating and then you know going back and going into the second edition, third edition. So I feel that um, while it's important, I can respect how it does help people to understand more of how they live their lives. It is not something that I choose because I feel that even in these representations, my hands are still getting dirty, same in, in the same way that my relatives and ancestors' hands got dirty um, when they were making these pieces. And um, the, the tradition of, I'm using the word tradition in that there is a knowledge that was passed down, be it through our relatives or be it through the books that are you know, telling you how you can make Navajo jewelry, just read this book. There is a lot of different resources that provide us with an idea of um, uh, creating and making these pieces to be shown more to people. So I, it, it's not something that does provide me with, um, you know, it's, it's not something that bothers me so much, but what does bother me is that there are so many people out there that when they hear that the way I try to iterate my jewelry as traditional jewelry, even though this necklace looks very, you know, contemporary, um, it's using turquoise um, in a way, and then the other side of the necklace is white shell. And it's just very elemental, like foundational ideas that the stones are what makes it traditional. Silver came in in the uh, 1800s and started being really uh, marketed as Navajo jewelry in the early 1800s, but the stones are what make it traditional because the turquoise is your male side and that's your left side, and the white shell is your female side and that's your right side. So that's what, for me, transcends the, I guess, and bridges that two world. So I've been on that bridge for a while. And it's been great to hear that there are a lot of people who um, uh, allow themselves to figure out how they want to talk about that. So um, it, but it's always a great conversation starter when people go back and forth about how they choose to identify themselves, be it two world or just being a person. Indeed. Uh, Jared, are you a two-world person or what? Well, I wish I was at a point uh, where it's long past figuring that out. Um, not with, a, it's, it's mostly because of the space I'm at in an MFA program where coming in with this traditional style of pottery in terms of material process and function, um, it's kind of awkward being in an MFA setting where kind of the idea of contemporary art needs to move toward abstract. And so it's, it's kind of an internal battle of how do I fit into this space? Like I know how I fit into my space back home, but how do I fit into this space with a non-native audience? And how do I talk about it to a non-native audience? Um, especially when I made these pots intent for community purpose. Um, and so that's been an interesting dynamic now. Um, I just got back from a national conference in education and ceramics called NSICA. It was in Minneapolis. It's a huge event. Some of the best artists were there. Um, uh, Chinupa spoke. Uh, Virgil Ortiz was there. Um, uh, uh, Courtney, Courtney uh, Leonard was there. Um, and it was really, really good to speak to them um, because one thing that I really noticed was We have an established native arts market with how my work's going to be seen there. But breaking through to like a nationwide ceramics and being respected there is different, um, especially with what values they have there, um, which is a whole different discussion. Um, but navigating that, um, being a person of color in this MFA program, um, where my Art style has a longer claim than the institution, like on this land, and I feel like I'm going to war there and having to like fight for myself, and and it's a uh, it's been a struggle in that sense, but it's been uh, luckily I've been surrounded by really good people to to give me um, a solid grounding and point of reference. I want to see if we can uh, start pushing the, the boundaries of, uh, of our understanding of tradition a, a bit more. Now, you're, you're both obviously people of 
great imagination and creativity. And when anyone looks at your work, you know, you can see, you know, a, a, a very uh, robust, you know, intellect at, at work, you know, in the things that you produce. Now, with that in mind, when it comes to the, the, the concept of tradition in the arts in general, the way that I, I understand it in light of my reading in uh, the history of Western art, uh, tradition is uh, something that is not only considered, you know, um, you know, antique, ancient, you know, historical in the broad sense, but also it's, it's, it's something that artists, whether they're the surrealists or the cubists or the futurists, want to free themselves from. You know, tra tradition is conservative, it's stuffy, it's boring, you know, it's, it's something that if you want to be an artist, you have to be able to break the shackles, you know, and, and free your mind from, from tradition. That's, that's the Western custom with respect to tradition. So, with that in mind, when it comes to your own innovations as artists, Is tradition something from which you're trying to free yourself, free your work, free your mind, or is there a, a different kind of relationship, you know, um, at, at, at work in, in what you're doing? Um, I feel that the work that I've been creating recently, uh, and thank you for for that, David, um, because I, I feel that there's. There's such a large community of jewelers that I am sort of already surrounded by. My father's colleagues are incredible jewelers, and Connie Sosi Kassan back there, and Wayne Kassan, you know. <laughs> They're amazing people. They are doing and they are continuing to do just, you know, things, and that it just kind of, you wonder how is it that you're able to um, add to that. But it's, I don't feel that it's so much tradition that I'm pulling from. I think I'm pulling from um, something that I haven't, that I've been observing this whole time, but I haven't been able to make my own. Even though I've been helping my father since 13, I only started making this um, jewelry and um, in this, making this my own jewelry since 2013, 2014. And that's it. So this is just um, me in this point looking at how I want to interpret the pieces that are very um, classic, classic Navajo styles, yes. But then also, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to work out a process of learning where I can go to different places, different studios, in particular Native female metalsmiths, um, so I can learn from them, because that reinforces um, the way that we have done it in the past, post Bosque Redondo, we would go to our relatives because they learned from one person while they were there, and um, and then now it's just it's you know all over the country. So I feel that when it comes to um, to you know where am I grabbing from and how do I push this forward, I I'm still learning. And um, I feel that there's always going to be small tweaks here and there, and I'm fine with that. I mean, Brakuji is my favorite person to talk about when you know creating this connection. He kept on making that bird more and more and more <coughs> simplistic, whereas I'm just trying to make something that is not so simplistic, but something that defines how I want and can see my friends and myself worrying. Um, and it's starting from there, how it becomes something more. Uh, I hope that the pieces are always going to uh, um, have a response from my community. I'm making it for the you know native academics, the native doctors, the native um, professionals out there, and um, this is something that speaks to them immediately. So until I can get past that, I don't know when I'll get past that. Um, but I feel that that's what's guiding the work right now. Um, and there's a lot to say in who we create these pieces for, but I'm trying to figure out a way where I can allow that to be affordable and accessible to my own friends and my family. So I think that that's, that's the vein in which I'm choosing um, to go by right now. That's, that's my purpose. Um, and it's, 
you know, everything you mentioned before about all the different schools of arts that have been pushing what tradition is, uh, mine right now is just the resiliency and how we can allow that to reverberate for future generations. Thank you. Jared? Um, for me, uh, I, I thought about this a lot my first semester of my MFA. I kind of realized I was standing on a path. Um, and I kind of, as I was working with clay and making clay, I saw like milestones manifested in material, process, um, finished work, failure. Um, and I decided to make pots that were traditional, um, made for traditional use, for ceremony, for community. Made with the intent that they wouldn't be in a gallery, they wouldn't be in a static in a museum behind a, where enamels interact between a plane of glass. And um, I made that as a solid reference, a reference point, so that as I continue down this path of my MFA and as a potter, I don't stray. Because the reason why I have this is because of tradition. And to try to separate it or run from it and try to break free into a contemporary art world, it seems inappropriate and very um, uh, selfish and not grateful. And uh, so now it's, it's, I think of it as there's this tradition that keeps on expanding. And the work that I do and hope to see others do expands the um, umbrella of what Navajo pottery is, mm -hmm. what the net pottery is and how it's used and um, whether function is a physical use um, used in daily life or ceremony or um, a use to tell a story or point out a point. Uh, have, have either or, or both of you encountered responses to your work that are along the lines, you know, that, look, that doesn't look very Indian to me? I live in North Carolina, and so anything on the <laughs> east of the Mississippi, it's, um, they imagine all the jewelry that's made from the 1900s and 1950s to be more real Navajo stuff. Even people from the reservation, I know, won't, um, they prefer it to be, if, if it's not heavy or if it's not like, you know, uh, really big turquoise, I mean, that's not Navajo enough for them. So it's coming from both sides. And, um, but really when it comes to my presence in the South, um, people and, you know, visiting scholars that come by, um, whose talks I attend, and I mentioned that I'm a jeweler, and they're like, oh, well, then how is it being here? And I thank God for social media, because that provides such a great gateway for us to um, uh, to continue the work I'm doing, and for the people who do understand it to be aware of it. And, um, you know, it's, that's how I'm able to navigate that, um, that question, because there's going to be a lot of work out there that are going to really appeal to people, and then others that do not. So, um, I don't exclude my jewelry from that. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think it's, um, I think I experienced this with the committee review with my MFA, sorry, my MFA has been on my mind a lot, um, <laughs> that two of the people on my panel, two of the professors, their expertise were not in Southwest art, uh, Native American art at all. And when I told them about these forms that I were making that were traditional and kind of classic iconic forms, I don't think they had ever seen them before. And they didn't know how to critique my work. Um, and they didn't know what to say to me, uh, rather than like to um, go on this beautiful rant of history of fine art versus folk art and, and how art coming out of Europe is viewed um, and given the most space on in museums on the top floor and then somehow American art is right down below it. Um, but I think mostly when people people are really curious, ask me a lot of questions of what certain designs are, um, because people haven't seen this style in a couple years. Um, but uh, I totally lost my train of thought. Yeah, I will say though that um, there are. I'm so glad that we have MS, MFA students going through this, and I I, I think that it's. Because it, it kind of, because um, it reminds me that I'm not around the MFA review board or I'm not around people who do talk about art in a way that definitely challenge, challenges your Indianness. And um, I'm, I'm considering an MFA program um, somewhere, sometime, but 
but that's only because um, being in the in the South, I've had to be very concise and very like con concise and efficient with my words and how I describe the work I do. So I am. Um, I hope. Um, that the background with anthropology or history and American Indian studies has provided me for that. But honestly, when I'm surrounded by a lot of art students, um, it's a whole different world. So I would definitely be on a different learning curve um, in that realm. So I'm, I see that our questions are different. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. yes. With that in mind, I want to... Um if we may revisit this um, two-world uh, paradigm from a different angle. Um, it's probably accurate to say that uh, the, the livelihood of any artist, especially, especially a Native artist, is contingent upon non-Indian markets, museums, and galleries, you know, in which case you know, as artists your, yourselves in, in that environment, do you find yourselves being torn by this definition of tradition that's coming from an, a non-indigenous place? You know, or are you able to maintain your sense of authenticity? You know, in, in, in spite of all of these um, market and gallery and, and, and museum forces ar around you. Um, yeah, uh, I don't necessarily think I feel torn, but I feel hesitant. I rethink, question myself a lot, um, mostly because of how things are defined. This kind of binary of tradition and non-tradition is a definition from an outside authority, an outside market. And so when it comes to making something like this, which is a helmet of Star Wars, um, but it has different aspects of different clay, has micaceous clay, um, has clay from uh, Monument Valley, um, and then also I only used pinion sap and specifically the visor, I inlaid it. And then there's a reed and then there's some sinew that I bought at the store. Um, so if I put that on the table at the Santa Fe Indian Market, or any other shows, categorizing is going to be awkward. Because Navajos aren't known for micaceous pottery. They're not necessarily known for reduction pottery. And so, but it might be put into a different category, but it was made by Navajo. So what, <laughs> who's, who's defining what? And so it, it's kind of struggling because it makes me think about really conscious of my materials and realizing that this discussion and these definitions need to be defined by us. Because it's our tradition and it's our future. And it, we have to have a say on how, that's, how that should be represented and um, it, it should be in something that we empower ourselves with. Um, and mine is more when I am at the booth and people mention that this is very modern, this is very contemporary, I step in and I wish I, I, I should have a printout of this right now but about what I, what I mean when I talk about the word traditional. What is, why do I talk about this as traditional jewelry? Um, and, you know, you guys did so well with me at ASU, and so I keep on going into these long conversations with one person, and it's exhausting at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's, it, it's interesting that um, it's, it is part of how we try to connect with people who understand, who may not understand it quite as well or in the way that I do, but at least there's one person in the whole row of people that they're visiting who is mentioning that this is why it's made in this particular way. Um, I'm definitely fighting a, a, a battle with very few people, uh, with very few people around because it's exhausting and I've only been doing this for five years and um, I look at my dad and he's been, he's a, he is a warrior, he's been definitely talking about it in a way that is really interesting. But then I make sure that when I'm balancing and talking about um, you know, people who are of galleries or people who are the buyer, but also people who are community members and friends who go to my booth to visit with me because that's the only time I get to visit with these people. Um, so it's, I know that when I'm in a space like Indian Market or any other show um, throughout the whole 
native market year, it's going to be exhausting. But I'm also going to be surrounded by people who have the same idea and same who understand the struggle of what that is. So it's um, if I were to sell, you know, my jewelry, um, I don't have gallery representation, but it's also because I don't have any jewelry when they when they sometimes ask. But when they provide the story with the jewelry. I'm always hesitant of them mentioning it as contemporary because it'd be great for them to mm -hmm. mention it as traditional or at least to have a good sense of why I call it traditional in the way that they talk about the jewelry to the person that's buying it. Because it's my having that um, having that taken away from me is something that I'm I am hesitant over. So it's interesting that you know we're both feeling the same thing um, about this. Well, speaking of uh, binary thinking, uh, are, are you of the opinion that when it comes to how we talk about indigenous art that we ought to do away with the terms uh, traditional and contemporary? I think that's only appropriate um, because it, I think it puts a chokehold on creativity. Um, if you think too much where about how is this going to be received? How is this going to... Where is it going to go? How is it going to be defined? Like, I was not thinking that when I was in my apartment <laughs> at 11.30 at night making this pot, but I just wanted to make it fun. And those were the times where I made my best work and it was received well. Sure. And um, it's the same reason why the like, kind of stresses about those things, why like, right now I'm not really selling my work, because I'm just making work. Because if I worry about a price or where it's going to go, it just adds a layer, a layer of stress. Um, so I think it's I think it's really important to not look at it as tradition and contemporary, but they exist. They're there. They're real. Like they reference each other, and so they exist together. Um, and contemporary is really just building on that tradition and taking in what it is, what is beautiful, um, and ex building that and adding that to tradition. Um, an example is uh, my grandmother Faye, she would build uh, corn, sculpt corn onto the side of her pots or other deities. And during that time, which was before my time, that was considered contemporary for an apple pottery. And now like me growing up, I view that as traditional in a way. And so it's an ongoing process. Um, and I think that when it comes to those two words, I mean, it's been it's been ongoing conversation for it's going to be a millennia that this conversation is going to keep on going. And honestly, as Indigenous people, we understand that yeah, let's not have the um, distinction on the pieces we create. But then you have people who are experiencing, um, you know, their experiences and how that question is posed to them in their work. It just depends on how you know, what their life experience, their lived experience is going to decide whether or not they feel like it's necessary. Um, and so even though I say, you know, I would love for there to be no distinction, I know that the market's not going to change. I know that history books are not going to change. There are even the people on the reservations who are not familiar with the way that we're talking about this as tradition, Navajo jewelry, they're going to say that it's not traditional, or it's not contemporary. They're not going to even use the word con contemporary. They're just going to say it is or it isn't traditional. So it's it's an ongoing conversation that I don't think is ever going to go away, but we can at least make the small steps in discussing how we choose to convey the word for what it stands for, which is continuity, where it's rooted and it reverberates and creates something that's vibrant. So. And when someone off the res or on the res does hear that, then it will provide at least a seed of something that can be become, maybe become something greater. So, um, but I know that the more we say, yes, there should be no word that, you know, we have, don't use contemporary. It's going to always be there, but I feel like the more, more we talk about how we understand tradition, it's, um, it is changing and it's great to hear that within our own uh, circle of friends, we all kind of agree on the idea that these um, these uh, these words are arbitrary because you know we are exactly how we're meant to be and in the way that we choose to describe it is traditional but it's also us as individuals within that tradition 
I'm struck by your observation that these terms, uh, traditional and contemporary, are, are always going to be there. I mean, I, I understand where um, that sentiment comes from. At the same time, um, of the opinion that if you want institutions to change the way that they talk about things, then you have to force them. Yeah. In which case, it's going to be up to us, the indigenous community, to come up with a whole new language for talking about ourselves and what we do and, and what we want people to know about what it is that, that we're, we're creating. So with, with that, uh, I want to um, refer back to something that you mentioned a few minutes ago uh, regarding how people at home and people from town, you know, will confront you with this, uh, you know, your, your work isn't quite Navajo ed enough. I was particularly struck by uh, your reference to people at home having this attitude towards your, your work. So with, with that, is it the case that uh, people at home have become too colonized with the Western definition of tradition? There's a lot more interesting topics that are happening at home that colonization, it, it does, it has, um, it has affected the way they live. So reservations and the lack of education, the lack of jobs, the way that the environment, um, you know, may, big industries that are on the reservations, in particular Pinyam, which is on Black Mesa, where coal companies are. Um, you know, the way that they, you can't live in my hometown unless you either work for the tribal government or you work for the coal mine or you have to go to a border town and, or you just don't work at all. You know, it's, it's, so when I talk about this, it's not something that is on the radar of, of daily life and I respect that and I think that it's something when they are in the mindset to engage with the work that I do because I'm there to be home and to support them and to be aware of how I can be a, a better family member you know eh, helps each other um, I need to support them but when they ask me what I'm doing then I'll let them know what I'm talking about and I feel that you know given the mindset of how I approach the way I discuss my jewelry, um, it could be something where they just don't want to hear about it because they had a really tough day, or they could be something, um, or they can you know really engage and talk about that and talk about their personal experiences. So it's it is really great to hear that um, um, it's great to hear that when they want to engage, they can understand it because it's not in their daily life when I talk about, you know, in these pieces, um, I don't live on the reservation. I visit them incrementally. Um, I grew up in Phoenix and I have lived um, here in New Mexico, in New York State, and now in North Carolina. And I come back and often, uh, come back and back here as often as I can. But, you know, my husband and I do talk about how the way that we, you know, either intellectualize his work as a geographer or my work as an artist, it is either going to resonate with our um, our tribe or it's some people it will, some the people it won't, because there's some other hard things happening there that um, you just have to sit there and listen and try to take in and support in any way you can. So how, uh, and this is a question for, for both of you, how, how does the, the work that you do uh, shape your relationship with uh, your, your, your family and community? That's a big question. It me. is a big question. It's a really big question because I, I um, we're a matriarch society. I mean, our first clan is our mother's clan and my mom's not Navajo, she's white. So, and I grew up off the reservation, but so seeing who my family was, I expected every Navajo family, like when I moved down here, to be like my family in terms of tradition, fluency, going to Yeguche, like considered traditionalists as well as everyone else they knew. And so I was surprised coming down and meeting others that didn't know their clans. And so pottery was an avenue that I could have a voice of kind of validation of um, there's an ongoing like discussion on Navajo amongst us that 
our youth aren't interested. Our youth have no desire to learn the language. They're, they just want to be on their phones and go live in Albuquerque or Phoenix. And uh, so for me, learning this um, opened up a, a, a stronger bond with my family. Um, and so uh, there was one thing I wanted to talk about with what you were saying. Um, it's just left my mind, um, but I'll come back to it if it comes to my mind. Um, yes, please do. Yeah. Uh, I think that the family, I mean, oh, geez, how do I describe the work that I do and how it affects family? It's a lot. It's given me a family beyond my immediate family. Um, it's provided me with a, a sense of a place that is beyond the reservation boundaries of my hometown, my tribe, to a place that encompasses this whole region. Um, it's provided me with a sense that wherever I go, I'm going to find Navajos, and that's kind of great. I love that. And when I describe to them the work that I create, they're even more connected because it, maybe it's not the necklace that you see that they're connecting to, it's perhaps the language necklaces that I create that allow them to um, have a word like Chiji or a word like Yadala or that says more of who they are and that they didn't know it existed. So um, it's my position in my family, uh, my extended, my immediate extended family, it hasn't changed. I mean, my dad's been doing this for a lovely long time. And along with my, my grand, both my grandmothers, um, Rena Begay, she's still leaving. My other grandma, Rena Esther Begay, she is no longer, she's passed away. Clifford Beck is a painter, he's an uncle, he passed away. And then my uncles, Leroy and Larry Begay are jewelers. So, you know, we all are kind of in this um, groove of knowing when the shows are and knowing when we get to get, get together and knowing when the ceremonies happen and knowing how to support one another. Uh, it, I'm just, they are happy that I'm continuing it, but uh, I think they were more happy when I started making jewelry when I was 13 years old, thinking I would like go straight into becoming an artist at that point, where they're just like, oh, Oh, you're you're making stuff. Looks really good, you know. <laughs> it's 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 um. I'm really humbled by them because I've been humbled every time I've been able to meet people in the arts and academics and um, you know everywhere else that uh, Navajo Native life is involved with the politics side and even you know the activism side too. So it's um the jewelry defines everything that I'm talking about more. I've had these thoughts and they haven't gone away. They've just been forming all these years and I'm able to create something that allows a visual representation of it. And um, I'm trying to move out of it just being um, uh, just the pieces themselves, but trying to figure out how I can tie in more video and film so that it provides a, a better idea of the three different um, parts of the journey of the piece, from idea to uh, the actual piece, to it becoming a belonging. But the, from the, the point from which, from which it's an idea and to the point where it's created, that's my time with that piece. Once it's provided, once it's given to another person, that's, you know, it's theirs. But that creation point is where I'm really trying to figure out how I can allow that to show that as a jeweler doing this as a, you know, traditional um, ways and understanding, here's the way that process is happening so that um, it provides a sense of place and, you know, people and understanding that you utilize all your resources, um, including, you know, this um, Indian, arts, in, um, Indian Arts Research Center um, collection they, um, and all the other collections around the country. So... Yes, uh, so you touched on a lot of things that I've been wanting to go off on. Um, when it comes about the coal mine, um, a lot of internal uh, issues happening um, in Dine Nation. Um, artists are, so society doesn't want to change. Society's comfortable. And artists are the most dangerous to changing that, of having a voice, to presenting art for to, to um, expose a social issue or social justice issue. And a lot of Native artists have, do a really good job of pointing out the outside influences on us 
that um, uh, historical references of oppression, genocide, all those things, but we fail to hold each other accountable, uh, point, out, point out flaws within ourselves. And so uh, I won't speak to it too much because I speak to it tomorrow for my grad review, but some of my, my recent work um, has been pointing out some of those influences on Navajo that people don't want to talk about but needs to be talked about. Um, specifically with outside ideologies and the current political climate of how America is divided. Um, conservative, liberal, it's really divided and there's a conversation of civility because no one can have a conversation without wanting to pull each other's hair out. And so I see that coming on to now, um, that same division. And I don't think it should have a place because we have our own issues that we don't need to be divided on. And so I think as artists, um, covering those things is really important, especially as Native artists. Yeah. And um, I made a piece recently for Esmosa, which is, um, it's a museum over in Segundo, El Segundo Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, I created a necklace that had all coal mine, um, coal nuggets. And I connected, I, one nugget was a raw piece of jet. If you're familiar with what jet looks like, or Akuma jet, it looks like coal. And so um, I made the piece and it was, uh, had the four sacred stones um, connected, like a pendant there that could be removed. But then I had a 20 minute conversation with people in my immediate family, my grandfather has black lungs, my um, uncle who worked with the Peabody coal mine, and then also another relative who lives in Kanta, who's, um, whose place in Kanta is actually being affected by all the dust storms. So a lot has happened when water has been removed. So uh, the necklace is, um, I, I created the necklace after having interviews with them. and. Uh, the interviews were inspired by my husband's dissertation about the coal development of Navajo Na on Navajo Nation. And he went and did this huge panel of like survey of people in the area. So I decided to take that and um, and he um, is you do what you want, like something that you, um, you do what you need to do. Um, and it's the moral economy of that is so prevalent in the reservation life. And so the necklace was kind of how I could combine my husband's work along with the work that I see um, in my own, my own work, but also in my own family. So it's, um, it's really great when we do get beyond ourselves to include the way um, our relatives live on reservations, but also um, you know, grasping the work that academics are doing currently. And I think that's important too you know, uh, have those conversations outside of just art. And um, being in a, you know, it's, tradition is the good point in which we can have that conversation and then just blossoms out into something beyond what people understood tradition at that point. I, I, I should explain my, my question. When uh, we talk about uh, these kind of I issues, uh, innovation, tradition, and, and so forth. Um, invariably, the context of MFA programs, selling in, in Santa Fe Indian Market, museums and galleries, becomes the, the dominant context in which we discuss the, the, these issues. In which case, and this is the reason for my, my question, what often gets uh, forgotten in a way, though not completely forgotten, is the situation back home, wherever back home may be, where most people on the res do not c consume a lot of art. You know, um, they do not have museums and galleries. There's a little bit of that going on, but certainly not to the same extent that you find it here, you know, in Santa Fe, you know, or New York, you know, or San Francisco, for, for example. In which case, uh, when it comes to, um, the kind of work that you're doing. The question that, that the additional question that, that comes to mind is with respect to your relationship to your family and community, 
what what you say is the good that you're producing with your work? Um, my good that I'm producing, I think, is uh, they see the family that knows me, like my 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 mom's side. Uh, they see they see my mom and my dad, and I think that's so important that they. They see people who have nurtured me, and uh, it's, they don't see it just being, I guess, Navajo jewelry. They see the, um, they see the way that, you know, uh, the style is a continuation of the people that taught me so well, and they enjoy the way that it's, um, it's their, their granddaughter, it's their niece. It's someone who they've um, nurtured and has been part of their lives, and this is where where they can um, see this person in a in a more in a fuller way. I think um, that is that that's there, and also my I mean I think my friends also see that in the way that I work because so many of them for a long time have known that I worked with my dad, but never really saw anything until more in the past five years, and they can just. They see something beyond it, and I think just knowing um, just one individual and seeing their growth, and that growth is, um, is who they are. I think that's the good that you provide in that immediate circle. How that is is uh, shown from that point on is to be known. But I know that when the work is connecting with people, where they 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 see me, I mean. They just, they know all the parts of me that everybody may or may not want to share, but they know everything. And uh, I think that's great because you want somebody who you love to be um, able to present themselves in a way that you've always wanted them to know themselves as. So I think that's, that's the good part for me. That's a very beautiful answer, by the way. Jared? Um, since I, I live in Albuquerque, um, sometimes it's hard to see the good that, that my pots do. Um, because I have a goal of what I want that good defined as, but that's like a future, future goal of teaching and, and having more young people do this style because there's, there's not a lot. Um, because when you have numbers, um, that's when innovation happens, that's when creativity sparks, sparks new things. Um, but I think for now, I see it as the relationships I build, uh, the connections I build back home, uh, the conversations where people are like, wow, this is cool, like your grandmother would be proud of you, which that's for me is really good, but that's like my own satisfaction, that's, that, that's personal, but when it comes to what's going back home, it's, I don't know how much I can speak to it, but like on the small interactions, I hope that it's inspiring to people, um, especially young people my age. Mm -hmm. That um, I mean, you don't have to be ashamed of who you are. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have, like, mm -hmm. be proud of who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no like. I mean, we all go through an identity crisis, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's important to 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 hold on to these these things that are real. All right, I have uh, one more question for our two panelists, and then we're going to open the floor up to. Uh, questions from um, our, our lovely audience. And so my, my, my last question as moderator for you is this. Um, if a young person, a native young person, were to tell you, I want to be an artist just like you, you know, say they're a high schooler, and I want to be an artist just like you, what, what, what's uh, the one piece of advice that you'd like to give him or her as they embark on their journey? Work hard, like, and, 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 and keep going. I mean, like, don't worry about how it's going to be received. Like, make work. And then, because like, I think as, as early on as an artist, you're always kind of hesitant to show your work, or even call yourself an artist, or like, is this good enough? It doesn't matter, do it. I think it's, it's what you're passionate about. And also, like, no matter what you're doing, you don't have to be specialized in one thing. Like specializations for insects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we should be very diverse in 
be able to do a lot of different things. So go become a teacher for mathematics during the day and practice your habit at night. <laughs> <laughs> That's great advice. <laughs> Um, I think mine is along the same lines of work hard, work, work smart. I think it's, um, you know, don't be, don't be um, so connected to what everyone else is doing and um, find your intent and purpose along the way because there's going to be a lot of failures that are going to deter you or block you and allow yourself to be vulnerable with those who can provide words of advice and encouragement to get you back on that journey of that purpose. And um, it's and it is important to definitely read outside of your your field, or at least experience something outside of your field, because um, that really allows you to not feel so just in one place. For me, it's my studio. I, I love my studio, but I also sometimes wish I was a painter so I can do murals in different areas. <laughs> so. I have one last thing to add sure. to that. Um, it's like Nitsak is like your thoughts. They're powerful. I mean, like in college, like everyone's going to school, they go amongst my peers, they're paying for it, but everybody loves to complain. Um, and be negative, like, oh, I gotta do all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. My best advice is embrace the grind. Like, <laughs> embrace it. If you're sitting, if you allow yourself to think negatively, it will drain you. It's hard to see, but it drains you. The stress drains you. Embrace it and embrace the passion and be kind to yourself in your mind. Like, don't say, like, I'm not good enough that, like, practice good mental hygiene <laughs> of, of, of reinforcing yourself and hey look I'm, I'm gonna do this like I got this this homework thing's gonna be easy I can go crank out this other piece of art like embrace it and I think for me the way I've been able to embrace it as he says it has been to not use the word busy because I think it encompasses so much of what we do that we are unable to share what that busy is with other people so um, even if it's just like, it's, it, try not to use the word busy. <laughs> Something that parallels this is I, I had the most wonderful opportunity to meet a national living treasure of Japan and Rita Porcelain and his job after World War II was to revitalize this style. And I listened to him talk and he talked about your health. Your health comes first. Take times to take a tea break. Give yourself breaks. Because if you take care of your health, that's how you achieve longevity in your craft. If like I'm constantly going, 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 I'm going to be sore the next day and won't be able to wedge any clay. Like you have to listen to that. At, at this point, um, we are going to open the floor up to Q&A. I was uh, in instructed that as we proceed, I am to uh, Call on you as, as you raise your hand, and then, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting further word from the back. Uh, we, we don't need to use microphones. We do not. We do not. But I will call on you. I am a professor, and I run a tight classroom. So, <laughs> <laughs> with, with that said, um, right here in the front row. So, um, I remember going to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and there was a big banner, and the banner said, all art was once contemporary. Yes. <laughs> um, but my question uh, has to do with, with Jared and his description of the Star Wars helmet as being traditional. Mm -hmm. and, and I liked your, um, your definition because I think what you said was that the materials were traditional and the, <clears throat> and, and the process of making it was traditional, so it didn't really matter what the object was that was made in those traditional ways. Is that right? Um, yes, that's one way to look at it, but I think at the end of the day for me, I'm going to define it however I want. Because I made it today, so like it's contemporary with contemporary people, but it's, um, it's an ongoing uh, thought for me. 
Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm really curious about your MFA program and how it affects you and how the faculty are affected by you, actually. Um, because what you're doing is not in the language that they're used to critiquing. Mm -hmm. So what were you hoping to get out of that program? I wanted to observe, um, I don't like to use like east-west um, terminology, but like a western institution, an institution that's framed not the way that is taught from where I'm from. And I wanted to observe how they taught and how it applied to my practice, and also how there were some things that did not translate or were inappropriate. Um, and then as, a, as all of that is, how does our art fit into this? And kind of experience that, because it's, it's, it's stressful, because that place was not made for me. <laughs> um, luckily, there's Clarence Cruz, who's um, a professor at UNM in Pueblo Pottery, who's an excellent support for me there. But when it comes to interactions with other professors, it's sometimes really hard to have conversations. Um, and so the reason why I'm doing this MFA is I, I want to teach. Um, I, that's, that's what I want to do. And so I'm, I'm using this experience to plan that. Well, I just want to add that it's been wonderful listening to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, it's more of a comment than a question. I'm a docent at the Indian Arts Research Center, and I never talk about contemporary work when I'm going to the pottery. I talk about traditional, transitional, and transformational. And you can find examples of those in almost every pueblo. Do the panelists have any response to those concepts? That sounds great. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Rose of, of like clay. Like they also like moons? Yes. Like, That's part of my installation tomorrow. Oh. Um, <laughs> it, it doesn't show at all, but it's kind of a critique on um, how we see land, um, how like our, our reservation land is defined and divided up and quantified, and that's not our way of thinking. And we're placed in that continuing to like battle these outside ideologies that are completely foreign. Um, it's also kind of a tribute to my favorite uh, subjects of uh, semiconductor physics with uh, crystal lattices and stuff, so. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Well, I am.